Melbourne University of Technology. I don't think that uh, many times in the history of this lecture theatre the class would have gone quiet without the uh, lecturer thumping the table and demanding silence, so thank you everybody. And uh, welcome to tonight's Chancellor's Lecture. My name is Michael Thorne and I work in the Chancellery here at Swinburne. Uh, this is a good time to check to make sure your mobile phone is off. In the immortal words of Molly Meldrum, do yourself a favour and uh, just avoid the embarrassment of the phone going off in the lecture. The likelihood is commensurate, of that happening is commensurate with the interest of the lecture and the silence of the crowd at the moment that your phone will ring. Uh, to introduce tonight's speakers, I welcome one of the key people behind the development and implementation of the Button Car Plan, the former Chair and CEO of the Productivity Commission, a former Secretary of the Victorian Department of Premier and Cabinet, a former Group Managing Director at Telstra, a former Group a former member of the board of the Australian Nuclear Science and Technology Organisation, a member of the panel of the Federal Government's Review of Higher Education, and the person who cleaned up the problems evident in the operations of the City of Brimbank. <laughs> I also welcome the current chair of the Port of Melbourne Corporation, the current chair of the Australian Safety and Compensation Council. Friends, I know it sounds as though I'm going to introduce about nine people. However, uh, all of these contribu uh, contributions and achievements are the work of one person. I'm delighted, therefore, to introduce the Chancellor of Swinburne, Mr Bill Scales, AO. Uh, thank you, Michael, very much, and welcome to all of our friends and guests and alumni of Swinburne University. Uh, it is funny about the, the, the Brimbank, though, isn't it? Of all of the things I've done in life, <laughs> Brimbank, you know, I'm famous for Brimbank. It was really funny. But I must tell you a very funny story of all of the things that I've done too, and all of the, you know, I, I don't mean that, I, I mean that in the most modest way. There was this wonderful uh, headline in uh, the local paper out of Brimbank after all of the fuss that happened out there, and there was me standing up there doing something, and there were these 11 councillors superimposed at the back of me. And there was this great headline on the front page that says, How Bill Saved the Wild West. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Ian was good enough to get a copy of this uh, uh, frame for me, which I, I'm eternally grateful. Um, look, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for being here tonight. As I said, it's really fantastic to have so many of Swinburne's friends and alumni here uh, with us. Uh, these uh, Chancellor's Lectures were started about three years ago. We did it for a very particular uh, set of reasons. Uh, the first was that we wanted to be able to say to our friends and alumni, uh, this is an opportunity to welcome, welcome you back to the university, to show you that we care about you, that we want to add you some, to, uh, add some value to your association with us, and we thought that these Chancellor's Lectures is one way of doing that. Uh, secondly, we wanted to bring to you and to the rest of the university an insight into some of the contemporary issues facing Australian society. And I think over the last uh, three years we've been able to do that with most of our Chancellor's lectures. The third thing we wanted to do was to try and highlight some of the terrific work that's going on here at Swinburne. And I think tonight's uh, lecture series, and I'll, and I'll briefly introduce that in a minute, is particularly important because not only is it about some uh, elements of, uh, of, uh, of a particular skill, but it brings together a series of elements of what Swinburne does to almost begin the process of creating new industries or a new industry, new labour markets, new, new ways by which we think about traditional industries. Because Tonight's, uh, tonight's lecture uh, will, will bring together elements of engineering, elements of design, elements of IT to create effectively what is uh, becoming a complete new industry, an industry where many of our, our uh, children, many of our grandchildren will find themselves not only being entertained by but being employed by. So it is a great pleasure to be able to uh, welcome tonight 
Sonny Tilders and John Barcham from the Creature Technology Company, the animatronics arm of international entertainment group Global Creatures. They're best known for their full-scale naturalistic dinosaurs in the Walking with Dinosaurs Arena Spectacular. If I just divert slightly, when I saw that title, I wondered, for, wondered whether it was about Ian and I walking along <laughs> somewhere. <laughs> but I realised it wasn't after I, I read a bit more about it. Um, Sonny Tilders is in fact the leader in the field of animatronics engineering. As the founder and creative director of the Creature Technology Company, he designs and builds extraordinary creatures. Uh, he graduated from Swinburne in 1989 with a Bachelor of Arts in Graphic Design. Sonny then spent the next 10 years at Australia's foremost models and effects company. Our other speaker, John Barcham, is General Manager of the Creature Technology Company. And I think John's background also speaks volumes for what Swinburne uh, is also about. He's an arts management specialist. And John has been involved in festivals, major public art works and high profile cultural capital projects, include, including the major satirical puppetry pilot for the Southern Star and the National Puppetry and Animatronics Summit. So with those few words, ladies and gentlemen, can you please welcome Sonny Tilders and John Barsham to talk to us. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, Chancellor uh, Scales, ladies and gentlemen, um, as I've just been introduced, my name's John Barchan. I'm the general manager of the Creature Technology Company and uh, I'm here obviously with Sonny tonight. Um, first of all, just to set the scene, we're just going to run a short show reel which was shot a few years ago. Uh, I'll then provide some statistics on the success of Walking with Dinosaurs, the Arena Spectacular, uh, followed by a brief description by myself of who and what we are, and then hand over to Sonny. Uh, we'd like to thank Swinburne for this opportunity to talk to you this evening. It's certainly a great honour to be here. Imagine being in the presence of a dinosaur. Paleontologists tell us of carnivores as tall as a two-storied house, of herbivores that weigh the equivalent of 20 elephants. But even the best imagination is hard pressed to grasp such incredible proportions. But what would it be like to actually stand next to a dinosaur? Not some cumbersome repetitive display, but a creature that looks, moves and acts just like the real thing. About 10 years ago now that we started making a series called Walking with Dinosaurs, um, the idea was to take Jurassic Park style graphics and put them into a television show. And it had been extraordinarily successful and a lot of people had grown to understand and imagine dinosaurs through those programs. But the proposal here in this arena spectacle was that the animals would get up and walk. They would move around and the audience would believe that they're fighting and doing all the other stuff in front of them. Because at its core, the arena spectacle has to do what the series did, and that is to make people imagine they're looking at real animals. There isn't a kid on Earth, I don't think, that isn't interested in dinosaurs. They're absolutely dumbstruck with how amazing it is to see a dinosaur. They're so lifelike, they take on a personality of their own. They roared, they screamed, and they laughed, and uh, it's just been overwhelming. The scale of the show is enormous in more ways than one. The, the dinosaurs themselves are all life-size, and a life-size brachiosaur is 35 foot tall. Um, a life-size T-Rex is, is 18 foot at the shoulder. There's nothing like it in terms of its combination of storytelling, um, technology, puppetry, and uh, 
and pure entertainment, combined of course with, with, with education. It both t terrified me and excited me at the same time to, to create 16 life-size dinosaurs to, uh, to walk independently around a stage. We have very clever engineering to make these things nimble and, and move efficiently around the stage. We have radio control systems um, and to drive it all of course we have uh, very clever performers. It was amazing. It's really fun and exciting. Truly we're back millions of years and they were alive. They sounded real, they moved real, they are real. Dinosaur to work, Dad? No, it's not. <laughs> yeah. Yes, it is. It's a baby T-Rex wow. from a new show that's about to start touring the country, walking with dinosaurs. He looks sweet, actually. You know what he thinks of you, Alex? <laughs> Punch. <laughs> Once the idea for walking with dinosaurs was hatched, it took hundreds of people, artists, sculptors, and engineers, six years and $20 million to bring these dinosaurs to life. is Walking with Dinosaurs, an unprecedented marriage of science and animatronics roaming stadiums across America. Almost all of the dinosaurs in this show were created to be life-size, but unless you're here in the arena, you have no concept of how big they really are. For example, I am 33 feet off the ground right now, and she, well, she's 36 feet tall and almost touching the light grids here in the arena. I love that big Tyrannosaurus Rex. He was fantastic. Oh, I thought it was sensational. It's very realistic. It's over the top. It's over the top. It took my breath away. Now you're coming to Madison Square Garden in New York City, and you had this incredible event today. You let the dinosaurs enter onto 7th Avenue, sort of taking over New York City. What was that like? Obviously, it's uh, you know a unique experience for people to see a dinosaur walking around. That's what the show's success is, I suppose. Audiences can expect to see 170 million years of dinosaur history in about 100 minutes, basically. So as you can imagine, it's a pretty uh, jam-packed evening in the theatre. It's very important to make sure that people understand that it's a theatrical experience. It's been considered and conceived as a theatrical experience. No matter where we go, you'll always uh, see an audience react the same way, whether it be Adelaide in Australia or whether it be Saskatoon in Canada or here in Madison Square Garden. The audiences respond unanimously, universally. They just believe that they're real and they love the show. So that's been that's been one of the biggest boosts for all of us. It's part spectacular, part musical, uh, part documentary. In the end, it's uh, I think it's just pure entertainment. Just to give you some statistics on walking with dinosaurs to set the scene before I talk a little further about the Creature Technology Company and what we're doing. Walking with Dinosaurs, the Arena Spectacular has two touring productions. The first toured Australia, the USA, Canada and Mexico. The second toured the UK, Europe and is currently touring Asia. Globally, there has been to date over 1,600 performances in 198 cities. The show has been seen by 7 million people. Gross ticket sales have reached $350 million. In 2009, Walking with Dinosaurs was the world's leading touring family show. Only you two, ACDC and Bruce Springsteen sold more tickets. <laughs> uh, prior to hearing from Sonny, I'd like to provide some background information on what CTC actually is from a, a business perspective. How do you take a successful show like Walking with Dinosaurs 
and turn it into a successful business. This is the challenge that we face. The Creature Technology Company is built on three pillars. The first is the idea of the Creature Technology Company. The second is our ability to carry out the idea. And the third is the money needed to establish and support the idea. I'll refer to Creature Technology Company as CTC. CTC as a company was born out of the success of Walking with Dinosaurs with the understanding that the show had created a proven, exciting and unique new genre of entertainment with animatronics and puppetry at its, at its core that could be successfully applied to a range of new ventures globally. It's important to point out that we are not a suits and boots sausage factory. We always aspire to innovation, design, fabrication and performance excellence at the highest possible level constantly challenging ourselves to push the boundaries of our design, artistic and fabrication endeavours. This pursuit of innovation and excellence is also fundamental in us retaining our international competitive edge. The success of Walking with Dinosaurs means that there are many who would like to emulate what we have achieved. We, have, we however believe that we have a unique provenance which would be extremely difficult to replicate. This provenance is derived from many years of hard-won experience, much of which has a uniquely Australian and a particularly Melbourne flavour. This provenance, combined with consistent innovation and plain hard work, we believe will keep us ahead of the pack and keep us internationally competitive. However, we cannot rest on our considerable laurels. A fundamental key to our ability to carry out the idea of CTC is obviously dependent on our staff and facilities. We occupy 10,000 square metres of office and workshop space at our West Melbourne facilities. This is, we believe, the largest and best equipped facility of its kind in the world. Careful planning and consistent investment in improvements makes our facility custom tailored for their purpose and we constantly adjust all our work areas to fit our needs as they grow and change. CTC currently employs over 50 people and counting. Every day as I do my rounds around the design studios and workshop, I am constantly reminded that what we are doing is unique in the world and that we are indeed inventing the rules as we drive our business forward. In many ways, our overlying organisational structure has the appearance of a conventional corporate structure. This allows us to run in a disciplined and directional manner that includes the use of complex financial, project management and human resources management systems. However, within this necessarily conventional operational structure is a very large dose of what I can only describe as the CTC mojo. This can best be outlined as having the following mm. attributes. All ideas are valid, no matter how crazy they may initially seem. Everyone within the organisation has the opportunity to express their ideas, a non-judgmental and a no-blame culture, mutual respect for individual skill sets and experience, risk-taking, i.e. let's try it and see what happens, collaboratively engaging in a creative process where boundaries are set aside, pride in workmanship and pride in mutual achievement, a sense that all of us who work at CTC are incredibly fortunate to have the opportunity to do what we do. In essence, we are a knowledge-based organisation. Management thinker Peter Drucker in his 1989 book, The New Realities, goes some way to describing this. Quote, the more knowledge-based an organisation becomes, the more it depends on the willingness of individuals to take responsibility for contribution to the whole, for understanding the objectives the values, the performance of the whole, and, to make, and for making themselves understood by the other professionals, the other knowledge people in the organisation." Our ability to carry out the idea of CTC also means that we work hand in glove with our, our, uh, with our producing arm, with the producing arm of the organisation, Global Creatures. Global Creatures, under CEO Carmen Pavlovich, is staffed by some of the best and most experienced people in the world of theatre. 
Animatronic building and large scale performance requires Hollywood sized budgets and CTC in conjunction with Global Creatures must proactively develop or seek out major projects on an international level to sustain our business in the long term. To this end, CTC and Global Creatures are together developing two major new international productions. The first of these is a stage version of King Kong. Endorsed by the state of Kong creator Marion C. Cooper, it is planned that this will premiere in Melbourne in late 2012 and then open on Broadway. This is a bold and audacious idea, but the considerable development work done to date is pointing to the fact that the initial exciting vision for this Broadway-style production has the potential to become a groundbreaking theatrical and commercially successful work. Our second production, currently under development, is for US, giant, uh, US entertainment giant DreamWorks Animation, headed by Jeffrey Katzenberg uh, of Lion King and Shrek fame. Katzenberg saw walking with dinosaurs early in the US tour and immediately recognised it was something new, different and exciting. To make a long story short, we are now working with DreamWorks to develop a multi-million dollar production for arenas based on DreamWorks' international uh, hit animation movie, How to Train Your Dragon. It's important to point out here that we are not slavishly replicating the movie, but we have genuine, made in Australia, creative input into production development that we believe will become a unique and exciting piece of arena-based theatre using traditional puppetry, high-end animatronics, physical and circus performance, coupled with state-of-the-art technical theatrics. By establishing an organisational structure comprising Global Creatures and the Creature Technology Company, we are able to fast-track our own ideas, as is the case with Kong, or present a unique one-stop production and fabrication option to clients or co-production partners of the stature of DreamWorks providing a simplified and safer path into the realisation of highly complex and very expensive productions. None of this is possible without money. And it's at this point I would like to pay tribute to a remarkable man, Jerry Ryan AO. Jerry is perhaps known as, uh, best known as the founder of the highly successful Dandenong-based recreational vehicle and caravan company, Jayco but he is also a visionary entrepreneur and philanthropist with a very diverse wide and wide range of interests. It was Jerry who had the sheer nerve to fund the creation of Walking with Dinosaurs, and you heard how much it cost him in that video. Uh, he was able to see the rich potential in what was to many an absolutely ludicrous idea. His support, trust and faith in the core team to deliver the show never wavered and that trust and faith was returned. His initial investment and subsequent success of Walking with Dinosaurs was the catalyst that allowed the creation of Global Creatures and the Creature Technology Company. We now sit on the cusp of a major new, f on the creation of the, uh, uh, I'll start again, sorry. We now sit on the cusp of the creation of a major new force in world theatre. And it's thanks to the initial vision and investment by one of Australia's most extraordinary business minds. As chairman of Global Creatures and CTC, Jerry remains very close to the business, offering us reassurance and guidance, whilst placing his trust in us to move the company successfully forward. Despite the success of Walking with Dinosaurs and the potential, and the potential that new productions such as Kong and How to Train Your Dragon present, we are ever mindful that we must constantly seek out and embark on new ventures. Conversion times are long and avoidance of production gaps is critical to our survival. We are constantly aware that we sit within a very narrow niche where opportunities of the kind that we require are rare. The sheer complexity, cost and time frames of what we do is usually poorly understood by potential clients and potential partners. Once realist, realistic opportunities are identified, a lengthy education process needs to be undertaken that will al allow us to achieve the excellence and unique attributes that attracted those clients in the first place. Uh, and it's not until this has been achieved that we are fully able to co commence serious production and uh, serious, serious development and pre-production. 
At present, a steady stream of quality, realistic inquiries we receive from around the globe augur well for the future of CTC. Ideas relating to museum blockbuster type ex exhibitions, aquarium based shows, continued interest from major players in Hollywood and future Global Creatures productions are all under active discussion. <coughs> it's important to point out here that CTC is a specialist creature shop, not a pro props shop or a generalist fabricator. The opportunities opening for us mean that opportunities for other Victorian based companies are also being created. These include opportunities for design, additive manufacturing, set building, specialist non-creature fabrication, audio-visual, physical and circus performance, and I make special mention here of Swinburne-based NICA who are actively engaged with us on both Kong and Dragons. Lighting design, technical components, marketing, promotion and so on. The future of CTC is no more assured than any other commercial enterprise but we believe we have a vision for our company that can be translated into the reality of dynamic commercial success on a global level. It will take much hard work, careful planning and more than a few sleepless nights. But who could ask for a more exciting challenge and we look forward to the risks and many levels of reward that await us in the year ahead. Thank you. I'm going to segue to Sonny, who will, I think, <coughs> be far more interesting than I. <laughs> that was very interesting, John. Uh, I just want to thank John. Uh, John's been with us for probably about 18 months, but John and I have worked together for, oh, for various employees uh, over the years, and um, I called uh, John the dino evangelist, and um, I think all those years in sales, uh, John, you, you talk us up really well, so thanks, thanks very much for that. Um, there's only one thing worse than public speaking for me, and that's seeing myself on the screen, so I'm glad that's <laughs> over. Um, but apparently I'm meant to imagine you all naked, and that will help me settle my nerves down. <laughs> uh, look, firstly, thanks, uh, Bill Scales and the Chancellery for, for this opportunity. It's, um, it's, it's quite an honour. I, I think I, I was saying earlier I said yes to it first and then pondered how daunting it would be later. But um, hopefully uh, I can... Say something interesting in tonight. Uh, something interesting tonight, and certainly I, I am a bit of a uh, an evangelist myself. I, I I am in a very interesting uh, industry, and I'm very humble to uh, humble to to have the the good fortune to be in it. So so here we go. I had a, I had a fairly open brief. I think we we sort of chewed around a few ideas, and I could um, give you a bit of a making of sort of presentation, but it's probably not appropriate. And there is a making of video. I thought maybe more interesting to talk about what animatronics is and I'm still stumped as to where people start with this line in the sand and so forgive me if I'm talking to people who I guess some of them some of you guys are design faculty you may you may know a little bit about what I do already but but I'll, I guess I'll start at the beginning it's been a really interesting process for me because um, I never stop to think about what I do I just do it and uh, so it's forced me to ponder the sort of things I've done in my career and so I hope it doesn't sound too uh, indulgent I will talk a little bit about um, how I got to do what I am doing now um, but as a way of, of stepping through the thinking behind um, the process of making animatronic creatures. Uh, I think, uh, look, and finally I'll, I'll touch a little bit on, on the, um, the rise of CGI, computer generated imagery, and the thing that promised to destroy my career. Um, and, um, uh, and in the end I'll, um, I'll include a unique perspective on George, George Lucas and his, uh, and his goiter. So I'll, I'll leave you hanging on that one. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so what is animatronics? I, I've always referred to animatronics simply as high-tech puppetry. It kind of encapsulates it all. Uh, although, or not, uh, although not exclusive to film, um, it's through feature films that this technique is certainly best known to all of you, I would assume. But essentially it's the use of electronics or mechanical means to manipulate, perform and control puppets. But really at the heart it's still puppetry. Um, and in real time, I say this to make a distinction between stop frame animation like Wallace and Gromit where the model is moved frame by frame and they take a, an image of it and it's the combination of those individual frames in a film that, that gives you the illusion of moving. <coughs> I admire the technique but I would find it fairly 
um, tedious to go through that process. There's something about capturing live movement, I think, that is the magic of, of uh, that I enjoy in, in what I do. So mo uh, modern, modern examples of, of uh, animatronics, and I use the term modern loosely, um, would be uh, um, seen in feature films such as Yoda from the early series of Star Wars, E.T. from E.T., uh, the Jim Henson's creatures in Labyrinth and Dark Crystal, and uh, the shark, I should say infam infamously the shark from uh, Spielberg's Jaws because it was famous for not working. Um, <laughs> And uh, I think uh, uh, set, set up a love-hate relationship for, for Spiel, for, with Spielberg for animatronics from there on in. <coughs> but when thinking about this list, I actually struggled to think of something made in the last 10 years that really incorporated significant use of animatronics. And I'll talk a bit about that later. I think the heyday of film animatronics seems to have come and gone within my professional lifetime, which I'm not that old, it's not that long. Um, the term audio animatronics uh, was first coined by the Disney Corporation to describe the mechanised characters developed for their theme parks in the US back in the s early 60s. Um, talking tiki birds were soon followed by the remarkable achievement of the time of an animated Abraham Lincoln that would deliver a speech and then stand up from its chair. And I can still remember seeing this on Channel 7 in my pyjamas on the wild world of Disney or the wonderful world of Disney being absolutely gobsmacked. And it was amazing. And look, maybe it's less gobsmacking now, but um, apparently they use decommissioned submarine inertial guidance systems as their computers to activate the valves and various things like that. So for 60s technology, it was extraordinary. And I think that started a little thing in the back of my mind that this could be something worth getting into. According to my Googling, the first animatronic to be used for film also sprung from the Disney Imagineering team in the 1964 film of Mary Poppins, in which Julie Andrews... Julie Andrews? Anthony. No, Anthony's the Australian one. Julie Andrews uh, balanced a small mechanical bird on her finger and it had this, which you can't see in the film, but it had this trail of cables that trailed up from the, away from camera side. It was all cable operated, strictly speaking, I suppose, not animatronic, but the, the term animatronic is reasonably broad. It doesn't have to have a single battery attached. Um, but apparently that was the first um, animatronic ever seen in film in 64. But it was in the late 70s and the 80s where the field really blossomed. Makeup effects and special effects had been established in independent departments in Hollywood filmmaking for many years. Um, but it was the combining of these two disciplines that really created the first animatronics or creature workshop or department within films. Such was the interest in, and uh, popularity of the effects created in this period that some of the top operators in the business became as sought after as the top film directors. So Stan Winston, renowned for films such as Aliens and Jurassic Park, and Rick Baker for films such as Men in Black and, and Gremlins, became Hollywood uh, celebrities. Not that I'm jealous at all. <laughs> and, and then, of course, there's Jim Henson. Um, if I had to name a single person that most influenced me to get into what I do, it would have to be him. Not that I've ever met the man, but, um, but certainly films like Dark Crystal were probably quite profound on me as a, as a teenager. Had a profound effect, I should say. Uh, I'm often asked how I got into what I do, usually by people, young, keen people, who, who want to start in the field themselves. I think, like most of the people I've worked with, I've been drawn to it somehow. But to be honest, we've all come from such diverse and different paths that there's no single answer to that. And that really is found in the fact that we have such a diverse workforce, from engineers to artisans to painters, sculptors. Um, there is absolutely, and certainly there's no course for it. So it's incredibly diverse. So I, 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 I don't have a simple answer for it. And then I usually go on a diatribe about how I got into it, which is what I'm about to go into. <laughs> Uh, in my senior years at high school, I had a fantastic art teacher and a really progressive course called 3D Arts. It was essentially sculpture, but I, I guess without the highfalutin title. It was really make what you think is cool. Uh, it allowed me to pursue some of my interests spurred on by these films. So I would sculpt clay versions of the creatures from Dark Crystal, or I would turn up in the wood lathe um, little R2-D2s, which is a little rubbish can <laughs> critter from, uh, from, from Star Wars. <coughs> However, the thought that I could ever make a career out of doing such things was a million miles away from reality for me, as fantastic as the creatures I was making. Um, particularly from a boy from Frankston and on the peninsula, it was really just, it was not going to go anywhere. Because that sort of stuff was always done in Hollywood, and Hollywood was this mythical land far, far away. 
where Abraham Lincoln lived. So with no animatronic degrees to be had, uh, I had a choice to make. I wanted a creative course. I wanted it to keep as open as possible, like all kids do, I guess. They don't want to be nailed down to a career path um, too early. So I looked at industrial design, I looked at fine art, and they sort of sat as bookends, really. Industrial design, quite technical and specific, and fine art, quite open and creative. And I know it's probably not a great criteria. I hope there's no graphic designers here, but I kind of picked graphic design because of the happy medium. Um, it sat in the middle. It, it felt open enough to me that it had career choices that could be more diverse than just doing posters. Um, and Swinburne at the time, and hopefully now, uh, had an unchallenged reputation. So it was an obvious choice for me, and unfortunately my folio got me into the, into the course. It was diverse. There was life drawing, there was printmaking, um, there was one Apple Macintosh computer for the whole faculty. Um, and you could do amazing things like make type bigger in front of, the, in front of your very eyes or stretch it. Or, but truth be known, I'm actually really glad that that was the computer input to the course because I think it would have been a very different course if it, if, I, I imagine it's a very, very different course today with, with such a desktop domain. I think that in a professional life you get at least one lucky break. I, I, I know that I've had, well I counted them, I had three. No, there's more than that, but, but, but there, there's certainly three significant ones in my career. The first was certainly at Swinburne. It was a great course, but truth be known, I struggled towards the end to really stay focused. I questioned if it was what I really wanted to do. My fourth year lecturer, Bruce Edwards, probably as frustrated with my, cro my progress as I was, dug up an article in the now defunct Design World magazine. I don't know how long it's been since that was published. And in it was an article uh, about a, a company called Mother's Art Productions. They made props and models and special effects for film and TV and they did still photography and lots of exciting things. Best still though, they were based in Richmond, they weren't some Hollywood business. And even better still, Shane Cargill, one of the company directors, was a swim uh, Swimburn alumnus. So Bruce kindly gave him a call and set up an interview with, with Shane for me. I had a very, I had a graphic design folio. It was, it had a couple of models in it, but it was pretty thin. Uh, so Shane had a sort of a, a tough call, but I offered to work for nothing. <laughs> and, uh, and he kindly said yes. <laughs> and I left nine years later, and he did pay me. Um, it was a sensational job that involved all the diversity I was craving. One of my first jobs was to turn up a tiny telescope for a parrot dressed as a pirate to use as a prop for a TV commercial. And it sounds really daggy now, but at the time it just blew my mind that a job like this could exist. <laughs> and one of the last things I did uh, there was um, to make giant whale sections, to um, full-size whale sections to breach the water on this underwater roller coaster for uh, a US miniseries called Moby Dick. Whilst having a great time at Mother's Art, I was also aware of the changing world in entertainment. And what I call Satellite Hollywood, I'm sure other people have called it that, but I've never heard it, uh, was starting up. Satellite Hollywood, I, I, I call it that because big film companies were looking to save money on ever-rising production costs in, in the US. And Australia, with its established film infrastructure, was a likely candidate. So Matrix, as far as I can recall, in 1998, was one of the first big effects-based feature films to arrive at their shores. And it was soon followed by the second in the revived Star Wars series. Both were shot at Fox in Sydney. Predating all this was actually a more of a home, homegrown affair with the Kennedy Miller production of Babe, which was another Jim Henson's uh, puppetry triumph. So I think without these blockbuster special effects laden films, I can say with some confidence that something like Walking with Dinosaurs, the Arena Spectacular, would not have been made. And this goes to what John was talking about, the, the, the provenance and the pedigree, really, that, that had to start 20 years ago. Um, look, it may have been made, but certainly not in this country. Without this exposure to the level of technical challenges, and most importantly, the budgets, that came with these films, there would simply not be enough experienced crew to even begin to ta tackle something this big. So to cut a long story short, I left Mother's Art in 1998 to try and chase some of this creature action. Uh, and then lucky break number two came when I heard about something interesting being shot in Sydney. It was a series called Farscape. And you all know it's a household name. 
Um, but it was already in its third season, and although tucked away in some obscure time slot on Channel 9, they didn't know what to do with it, like they don't know what to do with any sci-fi, although it does seem to have a bit of a resurgence these days. Um, it was the flagship of the US sci-fi channel, the giant organisation. And lucky for me, it was also a Jim Henson's co-production. It, uh, we were always frantically rushing things through. It had terrible deadlines, but it was exceptionally well resourced and full of insanely stupid creatures. I spent three seasons there doing old-fashioned animatronics. So I hope you don't think, again, it's indulgent, but I've got a, my demo reel. Um, but it's probably the best way to illustrate the sort of silly things we did and, and the amount of latex rubber we wasted. <laughs>
yeah, look, it was, it was a lot of fun. And, and, uh, and really, it's where quite a lot of us, I guess, cut our teeth, um, if that's the right expression, with animatronics. We got, to, we got to trial things, we got to muck around, and we got to take risks. And uh, I think that's a, that's a key thing if you want to do this sort of thing. <clears throat> so what is it about anim animatronics that I clearly love so much? I love the outcome, uh, creating the illusion of life, the sense of magic, which although coming from quite a technical methodology through animatronics, the result is still a form of puppetry. It is fooling people who want to be fooled. Um, we all know that puppets aren't alive, but we revel in the idea that we can see life in them. And that's, I think that's, a, that's a quite, I think it's the most profound thing about pu puppetry in a way. We love being fooled. We know it's not real. But I have to say that as much as I enjoy the outcome, it's the process that I enjoy the most. And in some ways, you need to. You can spend two months making something that ends up on the cutting room floor, or they may even just choose not to shoot it at all. So it can be kind of soul-destroying. But it doesn't mean you don't strive for excellence, and it doesn't mean that there is this sense that you're trying to make something that can be engaging and, engaging and exciting. I do believe there is something genuinely po polymathic about a career in animatronics. So again, forgive me if I'm getting carried away, but it's, it's a, it's a renaissance-like coming together of science and art, and this is what really excites me. The process constantly asks you to think with both sides of your brain, the creative and the more anal analytical. It starts with a vision of what the creature needs to be. This part can vary greatly from a specific brief, like make a parrot that looks exactly like this one, because it has to match a real parrot, or we need an alien character like you've never seen before. But both briefs require you to engage in your understanding of natural history, biology, and animal behavior. For even though the alien may be one that no one's ever seen before, you are presenting it to an audience whose reference point of what looks alive and plausible is the natural world around them. So the creature needs to impress and challenge people, but it also needs to sit on screen or on the stage as naturally as actors do. And by the way, in animatronics, we respect, respectfully refer to actors as meat puppets. <laughs> <laughs> it's charming, I know. Uh, before the practical process may begin, we always start with reference, reference and more reference. You really can't get enough, and thank God for the web. Some of this may be practical. For instance, we spent some time with the keepers at Melbourne Zoo, actually through John's connection when he worked at the zoo, uh, with the zookeepers backstage, that's not the right word, but with the keepers behind the scenes with the elephants. Um, and elephants being the largest land animal today, so it gave us clues as to how something so massive would walk, how the skin would fold and wrinkle and all those sort of things. And then more recently, of course, with um, King Kong on the agenda, we've spent some time with the gorillas and had some really privileged access backstage, backstage, it's the wrong term, anyway, behind the scenes uh, to, to yeah, get up and, cl and close and personal, not that personal, uh, with, with some of the gorillas out there. And that's been uh, quite a, uh, a moving experience for us because I think the Kong is going to be hopefully a moving experience for everyone that sees it. Sketches may follow, but really we're always keen to get into the, into the process of sculpting. And that's where the first artist is really engaged in the process of building an animatronic puppet. So we knock out sketches in clay, and at first they're often very quick and rough. And my old HOD at Farscape, Dave, El Dave Elsie, would take these immediately into Photoshop and then just play around with them to make sure that we're on the right track. And that's an approach we often use right now at CTC. So the size of the creature and the final method of the construction will determine the next step. If it's something smaller than a person, you would usually sculpt the piece one to one, and you would make moulds of it and cast it in some sort of final material. Um, but of course, when you're dealing with a dinosaur, uh, moulding and casting isn't um, practical at all. So the scale maquette exists purely as a base reference for, for, the, for the next process. As I said in there, and I think I did that for an American audience, but our brachiosaur stands four storeys high. I don't know how many feet that is or metres that is. But you simply cannot make something so big out of moulds. And other people have in the past, and I think that's where it comes a little unstuck. Um, our skins are all absolutely handmade and they're made on the sheet and I think the statistic is in our show that we've made four kilometres of lycra on the roll, 1.5 metre roll. Um, we've used four kilometres of lycra to make our 16 dinosaurs. So it's incredibly painstaking and, and, um, and labour intensive. While the body form is being developed, in the background you're already contemplating the technical side of things, engaging in an instinct for physics and an understanding of materials and the technologies that make things move. 
Once the design has been sculpted and approved, so the to and fro begins between the left and the right hand side of the brain. The analytical and technical constantly checking in with the, with the creative and aesthetic. As the creature takes shape, you reassess the progress. Once in the material form, you often find that things too heavy or the dynamics are wrong or the structure that you've set up sends up a bounce that you just can't bear to live with. Rarely do things end up better than the vision in your mind's eye. There's always this constant checking on the progress and making sure it all comes out right. So after the creature has been passed from engineer to tradesman, technician and, and crafts, craftsperson, it usually ends up in the hands of one of the traditional arts to finish. And so the painter takes over to realise the creature's final painted finish. I've often thought that da Vinci would have made a great creature maker if he could do something so trivial. But with his interest in natural history, engineering and of course startling artistic achievements. Most of the ancient scientists were in fact polymaths and then it all became too complex for one person. We had to specialise and pick fields and pick between the left and the right hand side of the brain. And I love that I can still exercise both with my work. Finally, I want to say a few things about the rise of CGI, computer generated effects, and the demise of animatronics in film. It's true, it's, it's happened, it, it's, it's almost over. The pain is almost over. Uh, I would love to be as, uh, proven otherwise, but I really do think that movie making has moved on from physical effects and, an, and animatronics. And in many ways, quite rightly so. I mean, when I first saw Gollum from Lord of the Rings, I thought, that's it, get another job. My career is over. <laughs> Because it was remarkable. You, know, you just could not do that with animatronics. But there's always the odd director that harks back to a day when filming was most of the work uh, and the post-production was just a little bit at the end. But really, I th they are the odd director. People say that it must, be, it must have been great to work on Star Wars. And it was a lot of fun and it looks impressive on a CV. But by the time I got my chance on the very last film, most, most of the creatures, creatures really were background creatures that we produced in the creature shop. And all the amazing hero characters were CGI. I spent three months making, or remaking I should say, the Nemoidians, which of course you all remember so well. Uh, they were green, egg-headed alien senators. What a <laughs> thrilling story. But they had 40 motors in their head, all captured in their hats actually. I'm glad they had hats. Um, and they were worn by actors, so you saw through the little slits and all these buzz, uh, motors would be buzzing around your head as an actor. Uh, we developed a brand new control system to program four minutes of dialogue. In the other episodes they had six minutes of dialogue, it all got cut. I was in the wrong film. Um, and we thought, we, we thought they were gorgeous, we, we were very excited. And then one exciting night we finally got a chance to have an audience with, with film royalty, with George Lucas, the great man himself to show him what he was in for, pre, pre the shoot. And so we were called to his office, and with no actor available, I dutifully donned the alien head with all the surveys in the skull and leads trailing down the back to the control system. And I sat there nervously with my head of department waiting for him to come off set. George finally came in, looking shagged from a long day at staring, of staring at blue screen. And he, really, he barely looked up. And uh, I, look, I set the dialogue in motion and I acted my little heart out. Uh, and to say that he looked interested, disinterested was to underestimate really what occurred. It was completely demoralising. Because George, of course, had long moved across to what I call the dark side of CGI. He was over animatronics and all the limitations of the physical world and was excited about the boundless possibilities of making films with pixels. Because, of course, he had invested hugely in his pixel company, a uh, digital company called Industrial Light and Magic. But as I say, look, CGI is a fantastic tool and it produces some stunning results. But I think it's the fact that it is boundless, that it isn't held, by, back, held back by physics that makes it, I think, dull movie making. And it removes a discipline from filmmaking. And of course, producers love it because it's risk-free. You don't have to worry about rain days. You don't have to worry about the thing breaking down like the shark did. Um, but you know, it, it's as predictable as the algorithms that drive the effects. And I think it actually shows, but of course I'm, I'm biased. To be honest, one of the lasting memories I have of my experience on Star Wars was actually sitting there in my rubber head, staring through the tiny slit in the mouth at a man that amongst 700 crew you never really get to see and if you do you avert your gaze because you're just too cool or you don't want to be sacked. 
Um, but now I was able to sit there and stare at this Hollywood enigma through the little slit in the, in the mouth of the thing, knowing that he couldn't see me, and stare, stare at this strange man in this incredible neck goiter. And really, that's my lasting memory of Star Wars. <laughs> But after Star Wars came my third lucky break, when out of the blue I received a call from a theatre producer that I had done some work for about a secret show with life-size dinosaurs. And that was four years ago. So since then, this crazy idea has driven somewhat of a renaissance and resurrection of what was a dying profession for many of us. As John has attested, we have an extraordinary group of people at CTC, having hand-picked them from, if not a, a large pool, but certainly a rich pool of talent in the Australian industry. Each of them is as, important, is, is as important as each other and in many ways far more important than I. My role really these days is directing these individuals towards the vision of what that creature needs to be, to be at the very start. So I was glad to have had the experience of looking at George Lucas's goiter up close and many other things in my time working in film, but I'm very grateful that we have found another outlet for our craft in live entertainment by unwittingly inventing a new genre. So, uh, thanks very much. And I think we've got our last little demo here. I imagine we now have 180 people who, want, who are hoping to enrol in design tomorrow. Um, if you send your application in, we'll certainly look at it. Um, we've got time for a couple of quick questions, but there isn't much time, so put your hand up as quickly as you can. There's got to be some questions. If not, I've got one. You don't want that. And we've got a microphone. We can... Tim Burton. Mars Tim, Attacks. Yeah. That's my most hated Tim Burton film. <laughs> Actually, I didn't like that one. I love Tim Burton. And um, um, without name dropping, but Tim's visited the workshop, which was 
great, uh, quite a thrill. But um, no, Master Tax not my not, not my favourite. But I think he's a he's an amazing. And look, of course, his exhibition is still here at the moment at, at Acme. Um, but um, someone I would dearly love to work with on something. Mm. Thank you. Um, most of what we know about dinosaurs is just a collection of bones. Um, how do you? Could you explain a little bit about how you research? I mean, how would they, how you know they walk? Yeah. What sort of colours would they have? How do their skin folds? I mean, <coughs> how much research has gone into fleshing out the bones that you see in a, a museum, for example? Yeah. Um, you're right. I mean, that's really the only certain thing is the bones. The rest is speculation. And I think, uh, I think paleontologists are a bit like economists. You ask, you know, 50 <laughs> economists and they'll have a different opinion. And that's something we found. Look, I guess my answer to that is that the show it doesn't, really can't be the latest in cutting edge um, paleontology. Um, the reality is, I mean, we had the, the series to start with. By the time we got that, that was already 10 years out of date. So, um, and then <coughs> the subsequent 10 years, it's just changed remarkably. I think that the, the figure is that they've found out, they've found more fossils in the last 10 to 15 years than they did in the previous 60 to 100 years of, of, of fossil finding. So I guess that's where I go back to that idea. Well, really, people's perception of what looks real is founded in the natural world. And I know paleontologists extrapolate in this way as well. I'm not a paleontologist, though. So I guess the, the strongest thing that I, I really wanted to achieve out of the dinosaur show was to evoke the sense of these creatures being alive and and the story uh, the show doesn't you know drive it too hard but nonetheless it's it's um it's quite um, a profound thing in a way if you imagine these creatures existed <laughs> and then and now yeah and so that's that was really that was the measure of success <laughs> look we in some of the press I do say we spent you know weeks with paleontologists, but it's, it's really not that true. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the, the, one, of the heads, one of the head starts was that we had um, my head of sculpture, Philip Miller, a fantastic puppet maker that I've worked with for years, and again, fortunate to get him as part of the team, absolute dinosaur nerd, and he had this many books, <laughs> which now live at CTC on dinosaurs, and, um, and that's probably the best head start we had. Time for one more question. You mentioned um, computer-generated graphics taking over from, from your sort of work in films. Um, the Sports Museum have a holograph. Of, I guess it's a hologram. Shane Warne walks around, sits on the furniture, all that sort of thing. Do mm. you see that sort of technology as being some sort of threat to your arena shows? Look, I really don't um, <coughs> because in the end I think it harks back to some of the things I said. It was never... Well, actually, Shane Warne was real. Let me... <laughs> let me <laughs> too real. Okay, I, I was just recently um, in uh, in America, and we went to the um, to Universal, and there's this um, new Hong Kong, uh, Hong Kong, King Kong, uh, uh, part of the Universal tour, and it's a 3D glasses-on experience where the whole you know, wagon goes in there, and you're sitting in the wagon. It's on a motion base, and you can see in this massive, very impressive egg-shaped cinema, a battle of King Kong and dinosaurs all around you. And it was fantastic, and it lasted for about a minute, I wanted more, and then I realised that really that was all it could sustain. And in the end you know that that's just a bunch of pixels around you and there's something about the old school stuff, about knowing that it's it sat on the stage with an actor, that gives it some sort of relevance, again harks back to that sense that we know it's not real, but we love the idea that we can make life out of bits of rubber and sticks and all that sort of stuff, and that's something much it's a longer history, I think, than filmmaking. That goes way back to storytelling of our ancestors. So that's my version of it. <laughs> All right. Can I slide yeah. you aside? <laughs> I need the microphone. Um, tonight, uh, Sonny's taken us through the importance of uh, Henson, Hollywood, the home of Abe Lincoln, uh, sculpture, Star Wars, Swinburne, and shown us some pretty scary characters. Um, as a consequence of his uh, presentation, we are re-evaluating our investment in ICT in the Faculty of Design. <laughs> it appears that it's counterproductive rather than productive. Um, he's also spoken to us about the importance of uh, lucky breaks and the wonders that can be produced by the combination of art and engineering. So a round of applause, please, for Sonny.
John introduced us to the wonders of the CTC Mojo, uh, which is clearly the driving force behind the wonderful things we've seen this evening. He spoke to us about the importance of combining commerce and creativity, and he also beautifully combined dragons, drucker, and dinosaurs in one very neat presentation. So a round of applause for John. <laughs> Friends, in addition to showing us the innovation, passion, and hard work and very well-deserved success, both John and Sonny have demonstrated their support for our university by sharing with us their wonderful presentation this evening. Sonny, of course, is a Swinburne graduate and we're very, very proud of him. If, like John and Sonny, you would like to continue to be part of Swinburne's work and development, please do not hesitate to get in touch with us at the Alumni and Development Office. Uh, the details are on the website. I should uh, also point out that this will be the last Chancellor's Lecture to be held in this location. Uh, next year's events will take place in our new state-of-the-art, much larger theatre that is being completed uh, up on Burwood Road in our new Advanced Technology Centre. I look forward to seeing you there next year. In the meantime, please travel home safely and uh, come to future events. Thank you. Swinburne University of Technology.